Everything is connected and balance is more important than the action you're taking to create it for yourself. How would your heart get along without your brain and vice versa? What if there was a plant that had plenty of sunlight but never any water? How would the earth get along if we did not have the moon, which is 238,000 miles away and there's nothing we need to do to make it effective, yet where will we be without it? We don't think about it, but it has a direct effect on how we live on this earth. You see, everything is connected and balance is more important than the action you're taking to create it for yourself. So when it comes to trumpet playing, how does a practice routine affect endurance? We're going to talk about that today in this video. We have a very special guest today, and I'm very excited to present this video to you. Today's guest is well known and respected in the trumpet community. He's the leading authority on all teachings, Claude Gordon. He's the author of the book, Hit It Hard and Wish It Well, Claude Gordon's approach to trumpet and brass playing. He's performed with Wayne Bergeron and Harry Kim and many others. He's a teacher of teachers and he's my teacher. I'm happy to bring to you today, Mr. Jeff Pirtle. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh yeah, it's my pleasure to bring you here with everyone. Um, we're going to begin this interview with this very simple question. I want to ask you, um, as far as I can tell, you're one of the original trumpet teachers online. And I wanted to ask you first, when did you begin teaching online? Okay. Um, 2004, I think was the very first time I taught online. I'm a, I'm a ham operator. I got into amateur radio when I was younger, probably about 1982. Played around with the internet actually before the web and did video chat with a black and white little tiny camera way before 2004. So around 2004, I had a student that had contacted me, actually a person before that, that wanted me to teach with video cassettes. And I was like, no, I can't do that because I need to be able to stop people and correct them and comment in real time. So then another guy, contacted me and I said, Hey, would you like to try doing video chat? And the first time I did it was using iChat, which, um, no longer, no longer exists, but it's, it's kind of like the predecessor to FaceTime. Oh, okay. So I wanted to ask you, so you started in 2004. So why did you choose to teach online? And 2004 is fairly early. And I would say, you know, at at that time, nobody was really trying to teach online. So why did you start doing that? What was attractive about that to you? Um, I had created my website that was about Claude Gordon because I wanted to present a lot of that information so that it didn't get lost and that people could kind of see the significance of it and how it could help them out. And I think I posted the first about my domain name in 1999 and maybe somewhere around 2003 or so, I really kind of finished my website and several people started complimenting me about it. And if, and then that's around the time when some people said, can I take lessons with you? And that first, the first person with the videotapes was somewhere out in Colorado and I'm in South Carolina now. And then the other person was in, was on tour in Lake Tahoe and, and then, so I said, Hey, you could come in person, but let's, would you mind trying it on video chat? And he was like, sure. He, he was a Mac user and Intel, this kind of stuff. So, so we set it up and played around with it and it, it worked great. And then from then on, it kind of gradually took off. And then when 2008 happened with the stock market collapse and all of that, it was kind of similar to the COVID times where a lot of things kind of changed with music and teaching and gigs and stuff like that. And at that point it was a little bit scary because I probably lost about a third of my students and then they started picking back up around the same time too. So it's like things reshuffled and kind of with the COVID stuff, it, it kind of happened too. So it's, it's kind of reminds me of what was going on back then, but 
at first people thought it, it really was not something real. Like I had a few people ask me, why would anyone want to do that? And I was like, well, the students that are doing it like it. So, you know, so it's, and now it's kind of a more mainstream thing and I think helps a lot of people. And, but I always thought all along, it wasn't about the, the technology, even though I'm really into it, it's more about the content that's what's behind it. Cause I don't want to be just a trumpet teacher on the internet. There's something more that I do with teaching the Claude Gordon stuff and how to practice a practice routine and, and use all these really cool books. Uh, what are some common problem areas that you see most students have in their trumpet playing? I, I think a lot of people don't, I mean, playing the trumpet is physical. So I think in some aspects, people don't get the idea of, of just how physical it is and taking a big breath and, and blowing as strong as they maybe need to. Um, now, I'm not saying it's about blasting uncontrollably loud or, or ugly or something like that, but to use the air in a way that allows you to play easier. Um, and then also having a, a smart practice routine and not not searching for some other kind of like shortcuts or gimmicks. Like there are a lot of those that exist where people think if they take one lesson from this person and they buy a mouthpiece or some kind of gadget or a new horn, it's never gonna take the, take the place of knowing how to work through great method books that might seem like they're slower, but it's actually the faster way to improve. But it's, it might not seem the most exciting thing to do, but it really allows you to get so much more. I guess that's kind of my summary. Right on. So I wanted to ask you also, you study with Claw Gordon for about 10 years? Yeah, about 10 years. From like 1984 to 1994. And, and then you, Claude Gordon studied with Herbert L. Clark for about 12 years or so, if I'm not mistaken. So in a way, there's a direct lineage in history between you and Clark. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, why, why did you feel it important to continue teaching Claude's methodologies? Um, because it, it really helped my playing and I saw how it helped a lot of other people. And I, I started with him right around the beginning of my 11th grade year in high school. And I started trumpet in fourth grade, but I was at a point to where I was practicing a lot, like maybe like four and a half hours in a day, but I was, I was getting worse and I couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And when I went to his first brass camp, I heard like, about 80 or 100 trumpet players off in the woods in California that were playing really good. And some of the people that were that were at this event were like Frank Kataravic with the um, principal term of the Philadelphia Orchestra or guys from Las Vegas or, or Los Angeles or guys that were touring. Like one year, the, one of the guys that was, I think was in our cabin was um, Marvin McFadden, who played with Huey Lewis in the news at that time, and I was like, no way. It was like, I was in high school and had heard all these different people, and I was like, they really take lessons too, and and so I saw it help me out, and, and but when I initially went to study with Claude, it was, I, I was kind of a typical high schooler where I was consumed about was playing high notes, and I'd heard Maynard Ferguson at Disneyland at a Memorial Day weekend jazz um, uh, like festival that they used to hold. And I, I thought, man, that's like so exciting and cool, but I couldn't do that. So it's just one more thing that I was like, man, what's wrong with my trumpet playing? What, what, how do you do that? And so then once I started taking with Claude, he, he was, he had me work on high notes and range stuff, but it was more about overall playing the trumpet. He made me play Clark's technical studies, scales and every keys, every key etudes and different keys, and it really started making me into a more complete trumpet player. And I don't think I really fully understood the value of that till I went to college in Los Angeles and realized that hey, I can actually do some things on the trumpet that other people can't do because he made me do all this stuff that that I didn't think really mattered, you know. 
So then it started making sense later, you know? Yeah, you said something that was important. You said you didn't think it mattered, but later you found out that it really did. And that was kind of what my introduction was about. Everything is connected. Um, we're going to get deeper into that. I want to ask you first, um, what are like the main core parts of trumpet playing? Well, <clears throat> both Herbert O. Clark and Claude Gordon kind of summarized it with their, their seven things. Um, they said the same exact thing, whether you're looking at um, Clark's Setting F Drills book or Claude Gordon's Systematic Approach book. It, they list these things off like wind power, the tongue, wind control, your fingers of your right hand, your grip of your left hand, muscle of your face, and your lip. Pretty much anyone that's like a great player does, does everything the same exact way regarding those things. People might use different method books or or practice different exercises, but when you watch someone play and you understand how it works, you can see that's what's going on, even though they might not even explain it. Um, you know, but and then there's more details on each of those things, but those are like kind of the most important things to always stay focused on, making sure your habits are all good in regards to those things and work through different method books that tackle and um, specifically target each of those items to make them work more efficiently and better and and anyway yeah that's very that's very good so many times uh people come to me and they'll say hey i'm having a problem with fill in the blank you know it could be it could be uh improvisation it could be tonguing it could be endurance fill in the blank range whatever and and then we'll, I listen to them play, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, you just need to practice um, some chickowitz flow studies. I think that's going to really help you. And so when we go over there that way, and they're like, hey, man, why are we doing this? And I explain it, but sometimes they're kind of like reluctantly doing it. But then like three or four weeks later, it's like, oh man, this this is so much better. You know, thank you. Everything's connected. Everything really is connected. So I want to ask you. Um, we hear the term often we will hear the term range and endurance like in the same phrase like they're one thing and I wanted to ask you like why do you believe this is so how, how closely related are the two yeah I, I kind of look at it as similar what you're saying I'll get a student and someone will come to me and say, oh, my problem is this or that. And what they don't always realize is that they're like underlying issues that are going to like improve all these other things. There's a book I read several years ago that used this phrase keystone habits. And kind of the point of it was that you have like this one primary habit. And if you get that right, it makes all the other things start to work. And I think a lot of times with trumpet playing, people say, I want to improve my sound or my range or whatever. And they they don't realize that like being able to play the trumpet easier, which is kind of what we're getting at, is like playing it physically easier is going to cause other things to happen. Like your sound will be better. Your responsiveness on notes will be better. Endurance will be better. High notes will be better. Flexibility will be better. And it's kind of like focusing at the most important fundamentals is going to allow the other things to start to fall in place. So I look at it as like endurance and range are kind of a byproduct of playing the trumpet easier. So that's kind of why uh, just when people just worry about endurance or just worrying about high notes, a lot of it gets them sidetracked on thinking that they've got to like focus too much on their lips or the corners or something like that. It's really not hitting at the, at the very core issue they need to focus on. Very well stated. And so with that said, I'm, I just have a simple question. And based on the, the core components of trumpet playing, my question is, what should be included in a routine? What are some basic things that we should cover every day? Okay. So this would be kind of a basic routine. And I'll, before I start, the one thing that 
is kind of really counterintuitive is knowing how to rest. Because a lot of people think like you're going to like get yourself tired and you're going to get stronger. Like you might do with like weightlifting or something like that where you tear your muscles down and rebuild. Trauma playing doesn't work like that. So you want to like learn to play easier and easier. So resting might seem like, oh, I don't need to rest. That is actually a much greater deal than most people think. Um, and with a lot of students, I, I'll have to like make them rest, say, take it off your mouth. So here's, here's the basic parts of routine. A breathing exercise, which could be standing in place, walking, jogging, that's like, I would consider that part of my practice. Then the next thing usually be like flexibility studies, which could be Irons, Walter Smith, Charles Cullen, Yel Stegers, a whole bunch of different things could fall into that category. Probably about anywhere from 20 minutes to like an hour of that, depending on how developed the person is. Then like tumming and scale stuff, um, like Clark's technical studies or a bunch of Arvin or a lot of different things like that. And then some etudes and then playing like solos, improv, stuff like that would fall in after that. And then ending the day with like a, a range study, which would take you down into the pedal tones, resting about five minutes or so, and then from the pedal tones working on up as high as you can go. That way you basically touched on all the physical skills on your trumpet. You've played in different keys. You've done slurring, tonguing, played some music, and hopefully played music that's not just in like one easy key, but maybe you have like an etude book you're working through like Walter Smith's top tones and you're playing in B major or G sharp minor and all these different things where you're pushing yourself to expose yourself to do lots of different things on the trumpet. So that is kind of what a routine would typically cover all those things. One cool thing that stood out to me when you were explaining that is the amount of time spent on flexibility. You said uh, 20 to 40 minutes on flexibility. That's very telling. Uh, can you talk about why? Yeah, I look at it as flexibility is kind of like, to me, it seems like if you, if you went to like, I'm not the most like, sports fanatic person but like going to PE class or I did martial arts for about two years and they made us like stretch for about 20 minutes well you can you could go in and start doing this stuff and and you wouldn't feel you'd make it work but if you stretch out you're more flexible and limber and then everything else is going to work much easier so I look at it as the flexibility part of, of the practice routine is similar to that where you're, you're getting used to first comfortably moving around the horn and coordinating tongue level and wind power and feeling where all the notes want to like resonate or respond with your trumpet. And one way I was just thinking of describing it, it's kind of like, like if you were to be a race car driver or something like that, and they would tune everything up and fine tune it right before they go to race down the track. And that's like, the flexibility stuff is kind of like that, where we're feeling where every single note is on the horn, and that starts our day, and then it becomes much easier to play everything else after that. And I also noticed that there were there were long tones absent. I don't think I heard you say anything about long tones. Is is that on purpose? Yeah, like one one of the things that's kind of unique about the uh, what we do with the clock organ stuff and all that is. You don't play long tones or mouthpiece buzzing or lead pot buzzing or lip buzzing or anything like that because the the flexibility is going to allow you to and pedal tones will allow you to get a more free kind of responsive feel and usually the long tones will tend to get people more focused on being stiffer and tighter and there are of course great players that that play long tones but i think that um too much of it can actually create some problems. Um, there's even a comment that's in like in the Clark's technical studies number six, where he says something to the effect that that by this point in the book, you probably realize the benefit of playing these in one breath instead of just holding long tones, because by doing flexibility and breath control things, 
it gets you used to being more agile and responsive. And long tones, I think the w the way people do them, I mean, you can use this in other parts of the practice routine where like in the systematic approach book, you are holding notes until all the errors out, but it's more, it's more for the purpose of kind of building up wind power. But at the same time you're doing that, you can gain more control by trying to sustain the note to where it's not fluctuating in pitch or intensity so that you're developing more control. But I think, I think by, I think wind power and learning how to control it is the bigger thing to focus on instead of thinking that you're building up like muscle strength in your face. Very good, very good. So I want to take this time to say if you have learned something new and if so far this has been helpful, please click the like button right now so other people can find the video. I want to take a moment right now to let you, some, let you know that I have a new course coming out in a few short weeks. It's about endurance. It's called Ultimate Endurance, but it's not available yet. But until then, you can go ahead and get my brand new PDF. It's called Master Endurance on Trumpet. I want you to have that. You can download it right now. It's available in the comments section. Go ahead and click it. It's some good information in there. And we're kind of talking about some of these things right now. Master Endurance on Trumpet. Click the link in the comments section below. All right, Jeff, if a player wanted to focus on endurance, and we kind of hinted about this a little earlier, but if they said, hey, um, endurance is a weakness in my playing, how do you recommend they practice or uh, what material would they want to focus on? Well, um, here's like, this has happened like in the past year, that, like with about three different older guys I can think of that were struggling with endurance. and. It was kind of the same story with with all of them where I knew that this was a big concern with them. And then as I had them start to do flexibility studies and feel that as you're ascending, doing the appropriate kick of air. So like if you're playing um, Walter Smith little flexibilities and you're going like low C up to a G on top of the staff, like uh, yeah. you're trying to crescendo as you go up so that they can sense that it's more the air doing it instead of their their chops or something like that like to change the pitch that kind of helps that crescendo as you're ascending helps unlock the feeling of how to play and use the air properly and you do it gradually through different flexibility studies and when as a teacher when i'm listening to it i'm kind of listening this might seem kind of weird but i'm listening for the feel that i'm kind of hearing and it's almost like when i'm hearing the student play it's almost like i can sense what's going on when they're playing because i've felt it myself and i can kind of hear and i know what they're getting or not getting so once that's kind of falling into place they play easier and then the, the range study stuff with systematic approach, of course, builds up endurance too, because what you're doing is you're expanding your ability to play lower and higher so that you're going to have in your practice room, you're going to be pushing yourself to go further than what you have to do in a, in a rehearsal or performance. And then it becomes that you're not pushing yourself to the, to the limit when you're, when you're out playing in front of other people. So that's, it's kind of like having different things that you're focused on when you're in your practice room versus out in public, you know. I want to ask you how much of a factor is gear when it comes to endurance? And what I mean is, for example, like the effects of playing a mouthpiece that's too small or too big or a trumpet that's, you know, wide open versus a trumpet that has more resistance. So, like, in that regard, um, how much of a factor is gear when it comes to endurance? I think playing... Like you're saying, it could be either way. Both a mouthpiece too small or too big. A lot of times, people are, are playing equipment that's a little bit too small, or probably another word I use for it is tighter. Um, so, so getting to with the sound or with like using your ear, what 
I want students to pick up on is that when they're playing the exercises, you're not just playing the notes, but you're trying to listen to how the note wants to be centered or resonant. So, I mean, we all know that we can like play a note on the trumpet and bend it like sharper or flatter, and it will still, we can make it come out. But there's like an exact point where the note wants to resonate. So when we're playing those flexibility studies, that helps you like tune into exactly where those notes should be. And part of it is listening to yourself to where you can hear what the sound sounds like. And if the math piece is too tight, it will it'll tend to be like, you know, like a smaller, more nasally sound. And if it's too open or too big, a lot of times it'll be like spread out and kind of unfocused. So there's kind of a, a middle point to where it's like a full sound that's that's also focused instead of spread out and, and you know like body sounding and that could be either the equipment or how the how the player is playing it whether they're playing slightly under or slightly above where the note wants to resonate so that's kind of where you have to use your ear and listen to yourself to to get more out of your practice um, um, now as far as playing open equipment i i personally play I guess would be considered extra large for equipment. Like the Quadwarden Selmer is like, it's modeled after a Miha Besson. Uh, that's what Quadwarden liked. So his binge and his Selmer trumpets that he designed were kind of modeled after that. Um, I think the bore on the Selmer is like 470. And the mouthpiece I play is a uh, Quadwarden Personal. I've played that since like 1984. And I think it's got a, a 20 throat in it. But I personally don't switch mouthpieces or trumpets. I mean, I, you can see behind me I've got a lot of different things, like a C trumpet and a piccolo trumpet and flugelhorn and all that. But I primarily practice on my B-flat trumpet the, the same thing that i played since 1984. I've got a, uh, two or three of them, but I play on the same one all the time because I want to be so tuned into that particular setup that then that's kind of my home base. And if I pick up piccolo trumpet or cornet or something like that, it's like, that's not the thing I practice as much as just the B-flat trumpet. And if, you know, if some people are orchestral players, like some of my students might do that more on C trumpet instead of B-flat, but hope, hope that answer your question. So I want to tell everybody that Jeff has his own YouTube channel, if you didn't know check it out the link is in the description below also so you can check it out direct link and um there's also a lot of great information on his website pertle.com jeff i wanted to ask you um on your youtube videos often you end your shorts with the phrase practice different so i wanted to ask you what what does that mean to practice different and why is it important okay i'll tell you I'll tell you where I kind of took the took the phrase from because I was trying to make it where people would, would like have something that'll stick in their mind. Well, I mean, you probably remember this. Like years ago, Apple did this ad. I'm a big Apple computer fan, and they did this thing where it was, they'd always say "think different," and they'd you know they'd um, tell stories about different people like Miles Davis or Thomas Edison or whatever. And so I wanted to say that kind of make the point of practicing it practice in a different way I mean, don't just go through the motion of, of playing Clark's technical states you got to do it a certain way because it's not all about doing the same exercises as everyone else it, there's a, the people that play the best don't practice the same way as average people so that's kind of where I'm getting at with that and so in all of our practice to like stay focused on that um, in Claude Gordon's daily trumpet routines he the beginning of it he makes some kind of statement like that where he says thousands of people play the instrument but you can only count the virtuosos on your hand that's because they they practice in a different way than than other people they don't just go through the motions they they're more focused they do the exercises a certain way and think about certain things when they're doing it and that's kind of what i'm trying to stress with those little short things is that so people might say hmm I never thought about doing it that way. Why would that matter? And then I'm trying to answer that, you know? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, 
before we move on to uh, Q and A, I want to ask you really quick, Jeff. Is there something that you're working on that you want the people to follow, or is there something that you're working on that you're really excited about right now? So I'm I'm on YouTube YouTube channel. I mean, you're you're of course you're I'm to learn from you with your all your stuff on YouTube. You're doing great. Um, I'm trying to make it to where on Mondays I'm summarizing a method book in one minute, and then on Wednesdays answering one of these questions in one minute. And the reason why the method books are so important is because I want I want us to not lose the value of all these great method books because I see people that go to college or take from other teachers and they'll just use a handful of method books but there's so much great material that we need to keep alive and use and see the value and wisdom that's in it so that's why I'm trying to summarize those and the questions we already talked about and then what I hope to start doing is on Fridays releasing um, edited videos and stuff from the I did like three years of of my own brass conferences and to put those up so that it's going to leave something that that's longer, maybe like 45 minutes or so that people could listen to and give them more, more in-depth things to think about with practicing. So that's, but that's going to roll out maybe in the next few weeks or a month or so. I'm still working on those. Um, I want to tell everybody that Jeff's been doing this for a long time, teaching trumpet. And he's, he's very passionate about it. So if you've never visit Pertle.com, check it out. There's so much value there. Um, I heard a, a lesson uh, where Susan Slaughter was the student and Claude Gordon was the teacher. And that's so valuable just to hear the pointers and hear a professional get taught by another professional. It's, it's wonderful. That's just one small example of what you'll find at the website. So you're, you're gonna need to create an account, but the account is free. You just It's free, just make an account and then just start reading the blogs and listening to the audio. It's really wonderful material there. Uh, we're gonna begin with this one from Nikki Miller. I happen to know Nikki, she's, a, um, she's actually a violinist who decided to uh, study trumpet because she's an educator and she wanted, she wanted to be better prepared for teaching trumpet to her students. And she's a very good trumpet player after studying with me for a little over a year. I'm very proud of her. So she has a question here. She says, if you're new to the trumpet, let me get my name out the way. If you're new to the trumpet, what would be your main focus areas and how would you distribute your time? Like when I teach students at all different levels. So the if I get someone, whether they're an adult or, or a child, the number one thing I want them to do, it's kind of like in this order. I want them to get used to blowing strong enough to get a big full sound. And then the second, almost as important, is producing a clean attack. Because I feel if I can get them to do those two things, like in the first week or two, I've got that foundation laid. So if they're just blowing kind of like uh, into the trumpet and not doing an attack, I'm going to harp on that until I've got that, got their tonguing and their just general strong blowing nailed down and right along with their twos, like being able to sense how to use tongue level thinking A for low notes, E for higher notes to feel how to move around the trumpet with that. So those three things are so basic to me that like if I got a, a student for their very first lesson, they never played a note that I want them to sustain a note. I want them to get used to just tonguing some repeated attacks on a note. And then I will hand write out, like just learning a low C to a G, or if they can't even go to a G, I might write a B flat to an F so they can feel how to move around like that. And then, then from there, I usually have everyone learn the chromatic scale first and then start adding as many major scales as they can get used to memorizing and clapping and counting and all the basic music fundamental things. And then I like to use this book by Claude Gordon called um, Physical Approach to Elementary Brass Playing because it's kind of a more simplified version of his systematic approach book. And then I'll modify it depending on the student to where I might take it lower or higher or change different things. He'll say, hey, do this again with K-tonguing or slurring or 
double tonguing or whatever and just take it at whatever their pace but back to those first three things it's kind of like i have a order of what's most important with with people i want to ask how do you explain tonguing to a, a beginner student that's uh something i've always been interested in and i know you teach k modified tonguing in general do you also teach that to a beginner yeah i, I do teach that to beginner students but i don't i don't over um i don't want to overanalyze it and get them thinking too much i think sometimes teachers can do that and then they get them get the student so worried about am i doing this or that that they can't even like do anything so i'll make it as simple as possible to say hey let's just play this note and make it sound like a clean t so they're going t t t t t instead of it coming out like th 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 or da 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 or something and then I'll just say, hey, just pronounce T, T, T like I'm doing, and then do that into the trumpet. Once it's sort of happening at a certain point, then I'll say, hey, let's do K, K also going key, 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 key. Once they get that happening, then I'll go back and I might, after that, explain, here's what we're doing. Your tip, your tongue should be at the top edge of your bottom teeth instead of up. So it's kind of like I introduce it in a, little bits so that it's not just throwing everything at them and getting overwhelmed, you know. Signs of a great teacher, ladies and gentlemen, signs of a great teacher. Um, I want to take a time to uh, put this question up by Minister Fitz. Let's see if, oh, here we go. Question is, how much time of practice per day is recommended? Also, should daily practice be one long session or broken into several times per day? That's the question he has. Um, a practice routine, I think, to get some kind of uh, progress coming out of it, I think you got to try to do like at least an hour. Um, if, like I know with myself personally, I mean, if I don't practice like at least – I get through at least like 30 minutes of my flexibility stays. I don't feel right. I mean, I can still play, but it doesn't really feel like I've accomplished very much. So about like the hour point, that's where it's all of a sudden, like now I'm starting to feel warmed up. Everything's working good. And now I'm ready to go a long time. So I try not to like my typical practice routine might range from like an hour and a half to two and a half hours. I've done longer, but I kind of look at it as, the focus needs to be more on like how you're doing it instead of the time. And to answer his question about, is it better to do one long session or several split up sessions? I personally think it's smarter to do several split up sessions, but doing it to where they're like in a, in the same category of the parts of your routine. Like for example, my first part of my routine now takes about an hour to get through the first the first 10 studies of Walter Smith lip flexibilities slurred and tongued. And then I do the literal section that comes after that. And then I do some, some other flexibility things. So that takes me about one hour. So I don't want to split that in the middle of that. Um, and then, then I might put my horn down and do some other stuff, teach lessons or play some Clarks or whatever. And then come for like 30 minutes, and then I'd take another big long break and play, play some etudes for maybe like 20 or 30 minutes. And then later I might play my range study, which takes about 30 minutes. So splitting it up is, is important. But some things I wouldn't split up, like my range study where it would go down to the pedals and then you rest a little bit and you come back up. If I did the pedal routine part and then took a super long break, then I wouldn't get the full benefit of the pedals helping out the high notes. So I don't want to split that up. Um, but like, I hope that makes sense with keeping certain groups of it together so that it's all the flexibility stuff is kind of one is building into the other one. So that's kind of, I think. Thank you, Jeff. That makes, that makes sense. We have a question from Anthony Linzo. He's saying um, it's about double and triple tonguing, multiple tonguing. Getting started, they say to get the air flowing. Can you add to that? Do you understand that question, Jeff? Yeah, I think I think what I'll say about that will probably help him. Um, so 
I was already mentioning like doing T by itself and doing K by itself. That will help double tonguing. And of course, doing TK. I also like to have students do backwards like KT. So you're going kitty, 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 ki. And it could be on one note when you're first starting to do it or in, a, in scales or chromatic scales or whatever kind of things that you're doing with that to kind of get you used to the coordination. But then once you're starting to try to push your speed, I think a lot of times people don't push themselves as far as they could. So like, say, for example, if you're doing um, like in Arvin, uh, like around like page 175, where it's got the double tonguing stuff, where it goes like, if you don't push yourself to go faster and you play too slow, like, I mean, you got to start at some point, but if you, you keep it like, and they, the notes can tend to be more chopped off, like, as you push your speed, it will feel like your tongue is kind of floating on the air where it's kind of going and your and your tongue is kind of being propelled by the air so as you push your metronome speeds to get yourself into that speed it'll start to get sloppier so you don't want to keep playing it sloppy and messy but you get that sensation because you push yourself and then back it down slower again and clean it up and then gradually ramp the speed up so that's why I think using a metronome is is useful for a lot of things. It helps you keep everything with good time and steady beat and even subdivisions, but it also gives you a way to track your speed to like push yourself to a, your maximum, and then you start experiencing how it's different, and you're like, whoa, it's kind of out of control. Let me slow it back down and get it under control and clean and even. And then once you get it back up to speed, then it's like you've got this new sensation about how the air in the tongue works with the fast double tonguing. I hope that worked. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was muted. Thank you for. Oh, okay. Thank <laughs> you for, for a great detailed explanation. It's very helpful. Uh, we have a question here from Ricky and Sharon. Can anyone realistically be self-taught? I mean, there there are a few people that have sort of done that, but the I have an article that's on my website that kind of. It was written by a student of mine, David Birdie from England, and he. It was such a good article that he wrote. I was like, man, I'm gonna put this on my website because you said it in a way better than I can. And it actually came from a book that he edited. Um, it's kind of like anyone that wants to be an Olympic athlete or you know, professional sports person, or my daughter's aspiring to be a ballerina. You just don't self-teach yourself. You need to have someone that's looking at you that's an outside opinion that can see things that you can't see and say, okay, fix this, um, adjust this. Here, I want you to work on these other things because I see you need to build this part of your playing in a way that you don't realize. Because... Um, I mean, hopefully, I mean, all of this is like I, I teach, I've taught since about 1984. And I know Chris has taught a lot. The more you do it, you're going to get better at explaining things and noticing things and picking up on things. So it's a much more efficient way to, to improve. Um, I mean, I, I think I added it up a while back that I probably have taught a hundred thousand lessons since I started teaching in, in 1984. I, at one point I used to teach 60 people a week and I teach a little over 40 now. Um, so hopefully in that time I dealt with like a whole bunch of different people and I'm going to be able to pick up on things and notice like here you need this and you need that and and you'll, you're going to get more out of it. Um, but that's not to say there aren't some people that 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 say they never took lessons but I think that it's like, why would I want to do that? It's the same thing with, I've heard some people before say, oh, I just need the Arvin book. It's like, why would you not go get all these other books and start working through them too? Because there's so much wisdom and benefit to be gained from learning from someone else that's gone through the process that hopefully will get you through it faster and with less struggles. Because I know when I'm teaching, I don't want people to struggle. And that was kind of like, 
Claude Gordon was too. It's like, it's like you don't have to like get frustrated because there is a way that works, you know? So it's like learning that is good. I want to also, I want to also say that I am a student of Jeff Proto right now, currently. So I'm a teacher and I'm a performer. So why would I hire a teacher? <laughs> because it's very valuable. And, um, you know, for me, I wanted to become a better trumpet player. Like, it's, it's really important for me to become better. Like, what good is it to stay at the same level or get worse? Because you, you, really, it's, it's almost impossible to stay the same. You're either getting better or worse. You know, so I can tell you, I just wanted to become better. And I, I decided I need a teacher. And... For me, since studying with Jeff, you guys tell me the same things. You know, every every player has has the same issues. But, you know, my range is easier. I'll tell you, so much easier to play. And I said range. Now, I didn't say high side. Now, it's easier to play higher and lower on the trumpet. And my endurance is better as well. Um, I'm a lot more I – guess, I guess I could say I'm playing the trumpet – the way it's supposed to be played more than I was before I started taking lessons. So I believe it's really important to, to have someone that you're accountable to and, and to show up on a regular basis and let them give you pointers. It's this, you're going to get better that way. It's hard to get as good as you can without a teacher. So um, that's what I want to say about it. So, that's that's what I want to say. All right, let's go into another question. Do you believe one size fits all mouthpiece, or do you wish? Uh, do you switch mouthpieces due to musical situations? Um, no, I I play. I'll tell you all the stuff that I play. I play, like I said, primarily my Claude Gordon Selmer B flat trumpet with a Claude Gordon Personal that was made by Canstall. Cancel is out of business now, but I played basically the same exact mouthpiece since 1984. Um, I use that mouthpiece if I'm playing on C trumpet or E flat trumpet. On my flugelhorn, well, there, there's an exception to that. On my cornet, I, on my piccolo trumpet, I even use the same exact cup, but it's got a um, it's got a different shank on it. It fits on the on the cornet shank for my Schilke P54 Piccolo. So some people do play the same or a very similar mouthpiece to what they play on a B flat or a C. So that's what I do on my Piccolo. I don't like to go to a shallower mouthpiece. I don't I think it doesn't sound as good. Like that loses some of the fullness in the sound. Um, then on my cornet, the Claude Gordon cornet mouthpiece is the same cup, but I have a Boston three star cornet that was made in 1907 and when i got it it i mean it's in awesome shape it was like someone found it in an attic and it's like brand new so it had two mouthpieces with it and when i first got it i didn't like the rims on it because they were like really kind of flat and squared off but i liked the cup so i sent the the mouth the Claude Gordon personal cornet mouthpiece with the the larger cornet cup that I like that was pretty deep like it's about as deep as a flugelhorn a modern flugelhorn I sent that to Bob Reeves and had him copy the the cup into that so I actually went deeper with the cornet mouthpiece and then on my flugelhorn mouthpiece Claude Gordon designed a, a flugelhorn mouthpiece and I was one of maybe like five or six people that tested him out and I was a younger student at the time and he picked the one that I didn't like um, but he never played flugelhorn and some of the other people that helped him pick it really didn't play flugelhorn as much as myself and another guy that we both like the deeper ones. So several years ago, Bob Reese have a, has a mouthpiece called HF, um, huge flugelhorn is what I think it stands for. And it's a really deep mouthpiece. It's probably like what would be like a deep French horn mouthpiece. That's what I play on my flugelhorn. So I don't, those are the only mouthpieces that I play on. I don't switch to like a shallow or um, a shallower mouthpiece to play lead trumpet or high notes or anything like that. Cause 
I mean, it's, I look at it as like, if I can't do it with the one mouthpiece, I don't want to like be messing around with it. Um, even before I started lessons with Claude Gordon, I stayed with a guy named Charles Brady before that. And he was trying to make this point to me. And he said, Hmm, I'd rather play on one bad mouthpiece instead of two good mouthpieces. And I was in high school at the time and in the kick of trying like, like, Al Hurt jet tone and Maynard Ferguson jet tone and a Perduva double cup and a lot of different mouthpieces I was messing around with. And he was kind of frustrated at me and I didn't get the point. I just thought he was kind of dumb. And when I went off to lessons with Claude Gordon, I was playing on a Maynard Ferguson jet tone and Claude actually didn't talk about the mouthpiece at first, but I could tell he looked at me and he didn't like it because I'd heard him at one of his camps talk about it. So I was, I came back to the next lesson and I'd put like a Bach one in my mouth, in my trumpet. And he, he all of a sudden got a little bit irritated at me. He said, did I tell you to switch your mouthpiece? It's like, no, I thought you'd like it better. And he was like, well, here, and he handed me the CD personally. He said, just play that and don't change again and throw the other ones away. So it's like, okay. So I got rid of the other ones. I didn't want to throw them away, but I actually sold them to some friends in high school and got the money back from them. But and that way I didn't have any of those around to like say, well, what would happen if I switched to this or that? So I didn't even have any other mouthpieces sitting around to like tempt myself to go try something else. And because I kind of looked at it as what Charles Brady was trying to get me to notice and Claude Gordon really got me to understand was like, it, it's more me and practicing my trumpet than anything else. Because if I don't sound the right way, I got to look at myself and what I'm doing with my practicing. So that's got to be my number one thing to always stay focused on. And I think it's a good thing. I'm not going to go on forever with the questions, but um, we have a couple here from Justin and they're, they're a little off topic, but I want to bring them up anyway. Um, let's, let's look at both of these questions. Is it kind of related? So he asked, um, first of all, don't be sorry to ask questions. That's what we're here for. He says, how do you go about building a social media presence as a trumpeter? So that's a business question. And then, how do you begin building a trumpet studio? Also, any tips for freelancers? Um, those are three questions. They're kind of related. Uh, what do you have to say about those, those things? Okay, so I think with... I mean, I... I consider that you're actually better at social media than me. I mean, I mean, I think my website's pretty good and I'm proud of it and everything, but I mean, you with your over 10,000 followers, you're doing really good with that. Um, I just like at the end of January made it past a thousand. So my, my YouTube channel is monetized and I'm still pretty new at that. But I think when you go, Let me interrupt you, Jeff, I'm sorry to interrupt the guest. Yeah. But just, just the same, you've been, teaching since 1984 so there's something valuable there and um, I'm just really getting started myself so you know there's something valuable that you have for for the people oh yeah yeah I mean I, I appreciate that and I, I mean I I think that I have something valuable <laughs> so I think I think one of the big things whether it to kind of answers all the questions is you kind of have to figure out who you are and what you like to do, what makes you excited and don't just try to be like someone else, you know, or copy someone else. Um, and of course we all like play really good and we have the people that we, we admire and we want to gain all these different skills. But if we're just a trumpet, a trumpet teacher or a trumpet player, it's like, who cares? Someone's going to go do the same thing and they're going to replace you. And the only thing that's going to matter is like whoever's the cheapest. So, I mean, I've always kind of thought that. So I didn't necessarily plan it out this way, but when I first created my website and all that and started teaching online, it wasn't about me just being a trumpet teacher online. It was, I like taking lessons with Claude Gordon and teaching the specific way I do is, is who I am and what makes what I do unique. So you kind of have to figure that out. Um, and that might apply to like the kind of music you play or, or 
write or put your own group together. Um, and it's your, your own unique niche. And I think once that's kind of established, then putting it out there, you know, on social media or your own website or wherever it might be. And, and the word will hopefully spread around that other people say, Oh, wow, I listened to this group and it was really cool. Or I took lessons from, from this guy and, and it really helped my playing. And that, I think that's the way, like we have to approach it because now with the internet, it's like everyone can connect to each other. And I think it's like kind of reshaping the whole music business. And I don't think some of the people that have been around for a long time, I don't think necessarily understand where it's going. Um, and I'm not saying that we can exactly tell that, but for example, when iTunes took off and it came about because of like Napster and, and people stealing music and then, then, um, they figured out how to do iTunes and do it in a better way. And then it totally changed things so that someone that could be in a remote part of the United States or the world could become a popular, like sell, sell music. And they didn't have to go through the, the channels in Los Angeles and dealing with stuff that was there. So now it's kind of opened the door to a lot of different ways. Now there's more people doing it and there could be, lower quality in some places, but it's still more, there's more opportunity. So then we have to kind of set ourselves apart so that it's like, here's why someone wants to come to you instead of someone else, instead of just looking at it as like, oh, this person is the closest or the cheapest or something like that. It's like, you have to be something that's unique and it has to be like you and you have to be kind of genuine about it. Yeah. I don't know if that answered all three questions, but if not, tell me what I, what I missed. <laughs> I would say, I would just agree with what you already stated. Um, cause it's, that's very, it's a lot to, it's a lot to cover there. So what I want to tell Justin, Justin, um, I have a podcast and everybody listening, I have a podcast called behind the note podcast, and it is advice for a successful music career. Justin, write me an email at trumpet lessons, hq at gmail.com there are a few specific episodes that i want to recommend to you all right so um i'm going to have last question and i want to talk to the audience and this is from coconut <laughs> a couple of months ago i was having a double buzz problem and i'm wondering if there's a way to differentiate a bad playing day or your amateur just needing rest how much rest is too much? Well, I mean, I look at it as when you're starting your practice and you get that feel where everything, it, like you feel like you're just warmed up, everything is really responsive and fresh and all your notes are like coming out. You don't have any notes that cut out because you're stiff or anything. You want to maintain that feel through all your practice. So that's some of the reason for the resting. Like I usually tell people if you're playing through an exercise, say if you're doing a flexibility study, you do open, and then before you go to second valve, you rest about 10 seconds with it not even touching your lips and go to the next one. And at first, it might seem like this is taking more time. But as you do that for maybe like a week or so, all of a sudden you'll start feeling like, wow, everything is working a lot better. Um, I had Claude Gordon do that to me when I was studying with him. He told me to take a wristwatch and put it on my stand because I personally don't ever feel like my chops get like sore here in the corners. I never feel that. And, but what would happen to me is when I was playing through some of the stuff, I'd start like notes wouldn't respond or I'd miss a note or split a note or something. And he could tell I was tired, but I didn't know that I was tired. So the resting kind of helped that. Now the double buzz thing without seeing you play or anything, some of that could be maybe that if the equipment's too tight or if you're, if your armature is down too low, then you don't have like when you're playing, most of the vibration comes off your top lip. So if your mouthpiece is down too low, it's kind of choking off that vibration. Um, that could cause some of it. Um, now changing that though, you, you, it would really be best to have like a teacher to walk you through it because if you just move it up to the 
top lip, you might be like, ah, I can't even play anymore after I do that. But working through the process of changing that might be necessary to like improve that. But hope that kind of answered. There's kind of like two parts of it and I don't know you or haven't seen you. So I hope that helps. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you, Jeff, so much. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, the audience for being here and sticking around with us. If you, I know some people come and, and dip in and dip out, and that's fine because this is live. Uh, click the like button if something uh, valuable was said today that's going to help you with your trumpet playing. I want to just do a, a really quick recap. Uh, it's important to have a routine because a, a routine promotes balance. And if you have any issues with range or endurance or tonguing or anything else, a routine is the first place to start to help you uh, reach your goals. Hey, Jeff, thanks a lot for joining us today. Don't hang up. I want to talk to you after we let everybody go. Okay. Sounds good. Proto.com. How can somebody study with you? Um, you can write me through the website and that'll shoot you back my, and actually it'll send you back my phone number and my email. So you'll be able to write to me with that. Um, I'm, I mean, I primarily use FaceTime and Skype. So pretty much anyone can get that. And uh, if you're in or want to come to the Greenville, South Carolina area, there's some people do that. I'm pretty close to the Greenville Spartanburg airport. Um, and also not too far from Atlanta or Charlotte, but, Doing it online works great. And like you were saying, I've done online since since uh, 2004. So I feel that the way I do stuff online works well and, and is pretty productive with the use of our time. I want to remind you that the new course is coming out on endurance in a few weeks. You can't buy it yet, but it's coming soon. Until then, download your free guide, Master Your Endurance on Trumpet. The link is in the description below. Thanks for spending time with us today. And we'll see you next time. God bless you.